Today we're uh, speaking about water baptism, and um, it's all about Jesus. You know, we just sang the chorus, it's all about you, Jesus, it's all about you. Well, water baptism and our relationship with God is all about Jesus Christ and his death and his life. We'll start with Revelation chapter 3. There's a number of scriptures that we're going to use this morning, but Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 and verse 20. And it says this, Write to Laodicea, to the angel of the church, God's yes, the faithful and accurate witness, the first of God's creation says, Look at me, I stand at the door, I knock. If you hear me call and open the door, I'll come right in and sit down to supper with you. Conquerors will sit alongside me at the head table, just as I have conquered took the place of honor at the side of my father. That's my gift to the conquerors. So before there can be a water baptism, there is first our confession of faith in Jesus Christ. Everything is about and points to Jesus Christ. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one who died for our sins. He is the one who rose from the dead. He's the one who saves us and cleanses our life. There is no, Jesus says, there is no other avenue, there's no other way to heaven but through me. And as we see these stories of of Buddhists and of Muslims and so on, and how that Jesus Christ is coming to them, coming to their life, and appearing to them. You know, there's there's such an emphasis on the power of God and upon the presence of God. And that it's not a theological argument. It's not a sit down and debate this and we'll come to a conclusion of Jesus as the only way to heaven. As this monk was steeped in his religion and in his faith, it was in that desire and reading about Jesus Christ on a little piece of paper that he came to have a knowledge or a hunger about Jesus Christ and how that that hunger turned into a as it were, a revelation of Jesus in which he forsook his faith and became a follower of Jesus Christ. And these are the things that are happening all around the world. These are the things that are happening in places that we would never dream of, that they are hearing about Jesus Christ. And it's not because of a theological argument, but because of a revelation, an understanding that Christ, that God has come to them. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there is an understanding in our life as we approach from the very basics of our basis of our of our humanity that we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. We all understand that we have flaws. You know, it isn't well, I I, you know, some people have said, Well, you know, I've never killed anybody. I've never robbed the bank. You know, so I'm really not a bad person. Well, it's not about being a good person or a bad person. We've all have flaws. And if you don't have any, well, talk to me later. But uh, the scriptures tell us that we all have flaws. We have all sinned. And sin means missing the mark. Missing the mark is missing the mark of perfection. We can't be perfect. Uh, God is the only one who is perfect. And he is the one who became the sacrifice for we who are flawed. The Bible even says all liars have their place in hell. I think, you know, has anyone ever not told a lie? (laughs) Well, anyhow, we see the idea. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to convince us that we've got flaws. But the Bible says all have sinned. But in the same token, if we, uh, as we understand that portion, we also understand that there are other portions of Scripture that tell us all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We also find that there's another scripture that says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So there is an all that starts out with our relationship with God, that all have sinned, and as we recognize that all, and we confess our sins, we find then that in the relationship that we have with God, there is a promise. There is a promise that God is going to do a work in our lives. Now, Thank you. Because of sin, <laughs> see, that's a cheer. Do you hear that? Yes, thank you. <laughs> and and, and I, was, I was thinking of 
how privileged our little ones are to be exposed to the presence of God here in church with you, with all of us, to have this exposure, to have this familiar understanding of God's Spirit in their life by being here. You know, sometimes people say, oh, I can't bring my kids to church. Hey, it's the best place for them. Well, they're noisy. So? (laughs) They're kids. You know, uh, and this is a joke, so don't. This is the following now is a joke, okay? All right, Uh, just, I heard it, okay? Uh, So don't, don't, don't get mad at me or throw anything at me. This lady was, she was a comedian. She is a comedian. She told the story. She said she never had children, so she was watching her uh, nephew, who was about three years old, and he was running all over the house and wouldn't listen, wouldn't obey, wouldn't do anything that she wanted. And she remembered that she had a dog, and once she had him neutered, everything changed. (laughs) Now, a comedian said that. I didn't make it up, nor do I believe that. Okay, I just wanted to throw that in there. But the idea is that we have a responsibility to spread the news of Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ is a part of our life. It isn't, he isn't someone we put on and go to church and then take off when we go home. He is in our life and he is there. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the word of God, becomes our understanding of life and understanding of eternal life and understanding of present life. So because of sin, then, there is a need. There's a need for someone to remove our sin from our lives. And it isn't a, I'm good and I'm bad. And at the end of life, if the good outweighs the bad, I go to heaven. And if the bad outweighs the good, I go to hell. Hello. That doesn't work. That's not how it is. We need a Savior to save us from our sins. God, when he forgives us of our sins, takes that failures, our missing of the mark, and it is removed from our life, and God has promised he will never remember them against us again. So therefore, our beginning with God in in forgiveness is that all of our past that has missed the mark is forgiven. You can say amen. (laughs) Amen? Amen? Now, with that forgiven, we can do something that God can't. We can remember our failures. He doesn't. So with that in mind, when we are remembering and trying to demoralize ourselves with our past failures, God is saying, forget that. Let that go. What did you learn How did it, how have you learned and how have you grown and how has his word changed you from the inside out? That word is the establishment of our life in Christ. And we move on from there. The frustration of I'm not good enough or never be good enough is correct. We never will be good enough on our own. You know, we never can do this. We can never make heaven on our own. Sin is missing the mark. We've all missed the mark. If you want to know the list of things, look at the Ten Commandments, you know. Bear false witness, covet, you know. know, We don't need to go on. So, I have been with numerous people who state, I hope I go to heaven. I hope I go to heaven. I've even been with clergy. uh, Not, you know, not of our denomination, but I'm sure there are some of ours that would say the same thing that in a time of weakness, we'd say, I hope I go to heaven. Well, our hope of going to heaven is not based on good enough, bad enough. Our assurance of heaven is based upon the work of Jesus Christ and my allowing that work of Christ to be in my life. So there is a certainty of eternity in the Christian life. Our Christian, our Christianity lies in the work and Jesus says, because I live, you shall live also. So there is an assurance based on the word and the authority of Jesus Christ 
that if we confess, <laughs> see, the, the scripture that we read in Revelation, it says, He stands at the door of our lives knocking. If you hear me call and open the door, I will come in. So the understanding is that God comes to each and every person. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Do you hear me calling? We had a friend, uh, he'd come to the house and he said he knocked. But he was the type of individual that if you didn't see him coming, you didn't hear him knock. <laughs> because he just, he always was uh, afraid of being an imposition. And, you know, we'd tell him, hey, don't, it's not an imposition. If you come, please let us know you're here. He says, well, I knocked and nobody answered the door. I mean, you, if you were standing next to the door, you couldn't hear it. But that was just the way he was, you know. And, and, you know, and if you didn't see him coming, you weren't going to hear him knocking. So in our life, no one will ever stand before God and say, I'll, uh, excuse me, God, you never came and knocked at my heart's door. <laughs> nope, sorry. God will remind us all of his knocking. But the truth for us is that we have heard the knock and God says, I will come in and I will sit down with you and I'll sit down and eat with you. I'll have supper with you. God is going to live his life in us as we open our life to him. Scripture says, by one man, Adam, sin came into the world and by one man, Christ, shall all be made alive. So Jesus Christ is a savior. He saves us from our sin to live a life that is eternal, but to also live a life in the present. So God doesn't offer us just some hope that is in the future. God offers us a hope that is in the future that comes back to the present, that cuts off the failures of our past from affecting the present decisions. Well, I tried this and failed. Okay, do you want to try it again? Is it something that God is leading you to? Is it something you feel that God wants you to do? Well, see, we can't use our failures as a way of stopping the work that God wants to do in our lives. Well, the story we told about the monk. Should their family stop? This person who was a monk and became a Christian was killed. Should all of, all of the family and all the church disband and walk away because of the difficulty? No, it became even stronger. If you want to talk about the history of the church, the church has always just blown up, as it were, expanded when it suffered great persecution. Because there is such a power and such a reality that comes alongside of believers. Sorry to say, we really don't, you know, in our Christian society in America, we really don't need God. What do we need God for? We can basically live our life on our own. We can basically go to work, earn our own living, and if, if I can't make it, well, then maybe I can get something from someplace else, you know, whatever, government or friends, family, steal, rob. I can do this. <laughs> but in other countries, when they give their life to Christ, they've taken on a death sentence. And in that sentence of physical death, they have extreme power in life. That no matter what happens, they're willing to die physically for the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they won't back down from it. See, that's an awareness of God that... I think really is beyond sometimes what we are even capable or even begin to understand. It is God who is at work in us. It is God who is at work in us and taking on our life and taking on the difficulties. The Message Bible in 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sin, He, Jesus, is, excuse me, this is the King James Version. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Message Bible says, if we claim that we're free of sin, meaning that I never had any, if we think we've never had any, 
we're only fooling ourselves. A claim, a claim like that is errant nonsense. On the other hand, if we admit our sin, make a clean breast of them, we won't, he won't let us down. He'll be true to himself. See, understanding the character of God is central to our understanding of the Scripture. Understanding the character of God is central to how that we live out our life in faith and live out the promises of God. The character of God. What is God like? Well, know this. He's not like me. <laughs> he's not like you. Sorry to say. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't look like you, and he doesn't have your personality. Aren't you glad? <laughs> you, know? you know? God isn't moody. God doesn't have bad days. Hello? <laughs> Do you have bad days? If you don't think I have bad days, ask the lady I live with. She's my wife, okay, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> you know, I have bad days. And sometimes more than I want to admit. And sometimes I'm a little fussy. <laughs> I'm a little cranky, you know. But... God is never cranky, he's never fussy, he's never short-tempered with us. He loves us more than we'll ever know. And our confession is basically saying to make known something that is wrong or damaging about ourselves. Well, God, I have sinned. I've missed the mark. I've failed in this, I've failed in that. And, you know, some people have mistakenly understood this as, I have to remember every sin that I did wrong and ask God to forgive me of every sin that I did wrong in order for that sin to be forgiven. Forget that. You don't have to relive every mistake. You don't have have to worry, oh, did I forget one? Did I forget one? Hey, the idea is, God, I have sinned, I have failed, and there's a whole list of them. You know them. (laughs) I ask you to forgive me of them. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. His character is just. Just. God is just. Not the just that we think of, but the just that his character sets up. So if we confess to Christ that we have sinned, the promise of God is he will forgive our sins and purge us of all the wrongdoing. He will set us free. We sing, you know, Tabby sings a song so eloquently. My chains are gone. I've been set free. What that means is that God has broken the power of sin in our life and we now have the power of Christ, the Holy Spirit and his word to direct us. And it is not a do this or die. It is follow me. Christ is the shepherd who leads his flock. He doesn't drive his flock with a whip and with a club. You know, if I fail God, he's going he's to zap me. Sorry. Wrong concept. That's not his character. His character is, my sheep know my voice, and they hear my voice. I knock, and they open the door. You see, God isn't about bra- barging into your life and taking over. God is about giving us the choice. The choice of choosing Forgiveness or not. Our relationship with Jesus is, first of all, he is our Savior. He forgives. His forgiveness is a divine provision of his death upon the cross. And then there is the reward that is ours, Matthew 25, 21. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. So heaven is our eternal reward. And the difference about us, and we spoke about this in Sunday school, We live our life from eternity backwards. Meaning God has told us the only thing that's really important in life is what you do for me. See, everything that we possess, somebody else is going to own. Everything we possess, somebody else is going to own. At some point in time, somebody else is going to own it. Because we're not going to be here for forever. And some of the things that we possess, houses, land, you know, cars will probably turn into junk someday. 
maybe now. Anyhow, you know, it's going to be recycled and re- done into something else. So it's all going to be somebody else's. So what is going to last for forever? I like the story of the guy. He, he shows, you know, he has the story. He shows up in heaven and he has all this stuff. He's God, look at all the stuff I got. You know, he who dies with the most toys wins. God, look at all the stuff I got. And so he says, okay, um, to go into heaven, you've got to, as it were, and this is his story. This isn't a biblical concept. This is the man's story. He says that uh, you've got to go through this tunnel. <laughs> you've got to go through this tunnel. So he says, okay. So he's dragging all the stuff that he's got with him. And while he gets in there, this humongous fire breaks out. It doesn't burn him up. But everything that is not eternal burns away. And he comes out the other side <laughs> with just a fraction of what he went in with. Because relationships are what last for eternity. And what we have done for Christ will last forever. That Buddhist monk who gave his life for Christ will have hundreds, thousands of people that he will have affected by his death that he will take with him into heaven. You see, these are the things. So our names are written in God's book of life, and we didn't write them there. God did. God didn't. We didn't go up. Hey, God, uh, you know, I mean, we'll put, we'll put my name in there. <laughs> Confess your sin. I am your Savior. I will write your name in my book of life. The, the most frightening words will be for those who stand at eternity and say, Jesus says, I don't know you. I knocked at your door, but you never let me in. I came to you so many times, so many different ways, and you said, no thanks. I don't know you. But you see, there is an awareness of sin in our life. There is knowing that we need forgiveness. There is a confession of our sin, God forgive me. There is the admonition for us then to follow Jesus into the waters of baptism. <laughs> there is the admonition that they, those in the early church who gave their life to Christ were baptized. And it was a way of setting them apart. Baptism literally means to be dipped or immersed. So water baptism signifies the death, burial, and resurrection of believers. Water baptism in itself does not save us. I'm sorry, there's no, there's no magic in the pool at the Pritz. <laughs> the pool at the Pritz. There's no magic in the water that if when you go out, when we go out there and we dip you, that you come out new because there's magic in the water or magic in the words, baptize you in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. There's no magic in that that erases sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ forgives us of our sins. People are baptized not to be forgiven. People are baptized not to be forgiven, but because they are forgiven. (laughs) We are baptized not to be forgiven, but because we are forgiven. So all who sincerely repent of their sins and experience a living faith and express a faith in a living Christ are eligible for baptism. We don't have infant baptism. We have infant dedication. Jesus, when he was eight days, eight, when Jesus, when he was eight days old, was taken by Mary and Joseph to the temple to be presented to the Lord, to God. And when he was beginning his ministry, he was baptized by John the Baptist. And all who were followers of Jesus were baptized, immersed in water. This was not a new tradition began, beginning with the disciples and the John the Baptist. That anyone who was a foreigner to Judaism and wanted to convert to Judaism would come and say, we want to leave our old gods and follow the God of Israel. 
they would go into the water and the law would be written to them, read to them and they would immerse themselves in the water as saying that they were giving up, dying out to their old life and accepting Judaism. So baptism, water baptism, especially by immersion, was not new to the Jewish people. It didn't begin with John the Baptist. It was very much a part of their traditions. And so when, we became, when they became followers of Jesus Christ, can you imagine the shock to the Jewish people when they saw these people being baptized, not into Judaism, but being baptized into followers of Jesus Christ? This was like, this was, you know, they're already Jewish. Why do they need to be baptized? They were baptized to signify that they were coming to Christ and being a follower of Jesus. So baptism in water is a sign to all that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Baptism by immersion is a sacred act. It's a sacred act that we do because we feel in our heart that Christ has saved us from our sin. And we find in the scriptures, it says that we follow Christ into the waters of baptism. You see, the lowering of an individual into the water is a picture of Christ's death accomplished. What did the death of Jesus Christ accomplish? His blood cleanses us from sin, the lowering. The submersion, what is its sign? It speaks of death. Death to an old way of life. I am dead with Christ. As Christ was dead in the grave, so too I am dead to my old life. His, the raising out of the water is that is the signifies that death is conquered. Christ's resurrection. I am raised with Christ to newness of life. So it is a sacred act declaring myself to Christ and to all. I am his work of forgiveness on the cross. I am buried with him in his death. I am resurrected to him in new life. Galatians 3.27 For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We are baptized into Christ and is it where we are putting on Christ? signifies that by faith, Christ is alive in our hearts. We are forgiven. Jesus said, I'll come right in and I'll sit down to supper with you. Conquerors will sit alongside of me. Conquerors will sit alongside of me. Who is Jesus sitting with? He's sitting with you. And he says, conquerors will sit by me. Who's sitting by him? you. I am more than a conqueror in Christ. (laughs) I have overcome. Christ in me has overcome. It is not about me. It's all about you, Jesus. (laughs) It's all about you. And then Ephesians, and I close with this, Ephesians 2.10. Now God has us where he wants us. With all the time in this world and the next all the time in this world and the next, to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. I've put on Christ. And in Christ, his mercy is his grace and his kindness. Saying, in is all his saying is all his idea. Saving, excuse me. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. That's forgiveness. We're allowing God to forgive us. I'm not doing this. God is forgiving me. He's knocking. I'm saying, come in. He says, God, I confess. He says, you're forgiven. It is his work. It is God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. Hey, look at me. I saved myself. (laughs) No, we didn't. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does. 
God invites us to join him in the work he does. When we are baptized into Christ, we put on Christ. We are joining him in the work that he does. That's why we are baptized in water. It is a declaration. God has saved me from my sin. Amen? Now, (laughs) I would like um, all those who are going to be baptized to come forward. And there, if there are those who would like to be baptized and didn't sign up, don't worry, you can. <laughs> are there others? Billy, she's downstairs. Okay, is anybody else? Well, if the idea is we've given our life to Christ and we're making a public test- testimony of how Christ has saved us from our sin. He's given us a new heart and a new life. Father, we thank you We thank you, Lord. We ask you to forgive us of our sins and live within our hearts. God, we are here by a divine call. You've called us to this place and time. We ask, O God, your blessing upon these lives and upon the service that will follow that is a sacred time of declaring you to all that we are your follower. And we put you on, O God, that, Lord, you are not only in our hearts, but, God, you are in our lives completely. Amen. God bless you. Let's all stand. (laughs) So, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time that is to follow. We ask, O God, your blessing upon our lives, upon our friendship, our fellowship, our walk with you. Bless us, O God. Bless us that we might be a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. We'll see you at the Pritz, the Prit Pool.